exciting for us and I'll try to do the intro as brief as I possibly can so we can get to Linda's talk but I do want to say a few things for our inaugural one here and that first of all this was a student idea and I had said that you know it's really too bad that in this age of COVID we aren't able to have our uh, guest lectures anymore with the speakers in the classroom and the student looked at me and said well why, why aren't you just doing them online and I sort of sheepishly had to look down and say well because I hadn't we hadn't thought of that at all. So let's let's do that. That sounds fantastic. So the next day I ran into Madison and Dr. Manicucci outside, mentioned this to them and the idea was really born there. So to start with a huge thank you to AICHE for facilitating all of this via the Zoom license and the planning. That's been just fantastic. But as far as bios go, I'm not going to do a detailed bio on Linda because she's going to talk about her experience and her career here and I don't want to take any of that, but I'd like to add maybe a bit of a personal touch which would be that I first got to meet Linda through our department's department advisory council. So we have a whole group of alums that get together, I think typically every February, and they give us feedback as a department. And I found Linda to be such a thoughtful and really caring person about the experience here at MSU, especially in our department. And she's really concerned with the well-being of our faculty and students and staff. It's really holistic there. So I think she's a great person to have that. You're going to learn a great amount about her engineering career and all those things. But I think that background is really important. And then secondly, she was in our inaugural spring 2020 book club, which is open only to second semester seniors. You'll receive a vague email about this later. And our first rule is not to talk about it, so I've already said too much. But Linda was a part of that. And again, very thoughtful, but also really fun and just a great person to get to know. And it's really been such an honor and a privilege to get to know her in that aspect as well. So that's just been great. So I'm so happy she's able to join us tonight. As far as the logistics go, I think Joseph put this in the chat, but please uh, use the Q&A section to post your questions and the panelists here can moderate that. Uh, we are recording this as well, so people can view it later. And I teach a, bit, a class later this evening, so I need to leave here around 6.30 after Linda does her part. So if you see me dash off, I don't wanna look rude. So again, AICHE, thank you so much. And Linda, thank you so much for being here. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Linda. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, okay. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Anderson, for that very kind intro introduction. And thank you also to, to Madison and Dr. Minicucci and AICHE for the opportunity to come and talk with you this evening. Uh, I, I, the purpose of this speech is to talk to you about uh, my career and give you some advice that I wish I would have had in hopes that it would um, maybe ease your journey into your career. But if you disagree with any of my advice, that's okay, because you are going to define your own version of success. And that's perfectly great. You know, your journey is your own. So I'm gonna try to keep my um, comments to under 20 minutes. I'm gonna start my little stopwatch so I can keep on track. And then that'll leave us more time at the end for questions and comments. And I'm going to cover three main areas, first job, career advice, and life advice. Um, before I jump into that, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on me. I grew up in Missoula, painfully socially awkward. Um, I attended MSU as a first generation student and uh, changed my major three times. And it took me five years to graduate. So then I, when I finally did graduate, it was in the 1980s during a recession. So it was kind of tough to, to find jobs. Um, I went to work for Conoco at an oil refinery in Louisiana. Not really what I was expecting, but uh, it gave me an opportunity to use my, my degree. I had jobs in process engineering, marketing, environmental engineering, and capital budget management. I've lived on three continents in North America. I've lived in Lake Charles, Louisiana, Houston, um, and then I was in Billings for 10 years. And then we had two years in London and two years in, more, most recently, two years in Perth, Australia. My husband, Daryl, is a, um, also an MSU chemical engineering graduate. He graduated a year before I did because he was on the four-year plan. So it took me a little longer to get out. But anyway, we um, both worked for Conoco, ConocoPhillips. We have uh, two adult daughters, 
and over 33 years have been uh, proud puppy parents to three golden retrievers. And Daryl and I are now retired and living in Bozeman. Okay, so jumping into first job. So finding a job, for me, um, what I had was career services at MSU. We didn't have career fairs. Uh, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have a lot of networking. So all those are tools that I, I hope you will use. And what I found out from recent graduates is that the networking is really important. Uh, if you can find out maybe if the company that they work for is hiring, that's a good way to get your foot in the door. I think it's important to keep in touch with those, those friends and also with MSU. And I believe career services can help you out even after you graduate. So I think it's important to, to stay in touch with MSU. So you have your, your first week, you're ready for your first week on the job. And I remember my first week, painfully so. I, I didn't know what the work attire was, but I'd worked in a pulp and paper mill in Missoula for uh, my summers. And I, you know, going to work in a refinery couldn't be that much different than working in a pulp and paper mill. So I showed up on my first day in work boots, jeans, and a collared shirt. And then uh, on the other end of the spectrum, another young woman who started the same day I did came to work assuming she was working for a multinational corporation. So she was going to dress the part in a, you know, blue suit, skirt, high heels, and one of those shirts with the big puffy bows. So the, the reality in a refinery is the attire was some, something in between. So I would recommend, if you have any questions about attire, ask first. Um, you're also going to be doing a lot of safety training and onboarding your first week. It can be tedious, it can be boring, but learn it, you're gonna be responsible for it. So it's important. And there's going to be, uh, long structured days. I really struggled with this. I was exhausted having to sit at a desk or being at work working for like nine hours a day, five days a week. You know, when my college experience was, you know, you walk from class to class and you might go back to your residence hall room or your apartment and you kind of break it up and you might work, you know, steady until 11 o'clock at night. But when you're at the job, you've got to be there for nine hours sitting at a desk and that can be really tough and exhausting so practice good ergonomics get up stretch move around a little bit um, now for the first six months looking at your job the first six months you're going to be pushed outside of your comfort zone montana state does a great job of giving you a technical foundation um, but when you whatever company you work for you're going to come in knowing Maybe you don't know as much as you thought you did. You're going to have a lot of learning. Like I didn't really know anything about how a petroleum refinery worked. So it's very humbling to realize how little you know. But again, MSU gives you problem solving skills and you'll be able to use those to do your job. Um, but you, you will be uncomfortable. They're going to ask you to do things that you don't know how to do and you're going to be learning. Uh, I think it's important to ask for help. Someone mentioned mentors. Uh, and a lot of times I think of a mentor as someone who will um, give you career advice. But another important mentor, it's more like a teacher. And, and that's someone who you can ask things you don't necessarily want to ask your supervisor. But you know, preferably maybe someone who's just been out of school a couple of years. Like what's the format for an inter-office inter memo? Or what do you all do for lunch? Or what's, how is this perceived? Um, so just having someone that you trust who can answer those questions for you, I think would be very helpful and you might avoid some awkward moments. Another piece of advice for your first six months is to um, get involved in things maybe outside of work or if your company gives back to the community in ways such as the United Way Day of Caring, volunteer for those activities. It's a great way to give back to your community and it's also a great way to get to know your work colleagues outside of work. It's important to build those, those relationships. So that's it for first job advice. Now I'm gonna to talk to you about career advice. This is the meat of my presentation. Uh, first piece of advice is you gotta keep on learning. The technology changes, business changes. I mean, who would have guessed we would be where we are today? So you've got to keep learning. Sharpen the saw is another way to, to put that. Um, work in one way you can keep on learning you know if you do work in a plant the first few years you get a lot of street credibility like in headquarters if you work in a plant you work the turnarounds you work the short uh, the shutdowns you know you've been there when things go wrong 
So um, working in a plant is, is a good way to get some great experience. Um, be open to new career paths. Um, like my, my career went um, in a lot of different directions and your degree will open a lot of doors for you. So be ready to take advantage of that. Um, and then because I did work for a large corporation for most of my career, I was able to go in these completely different career paths without changing companies. Take ownership of your career. You're going to be driving your career. If you want a job, make sure you're developing the skills needed for that job. So you'll be a candidate to be considered. Also, if you are in a situation where you're not comfortable or you don't like your job, um, you can take steps to prepare yourself for your next job. There's two examples I'd like to share. Um, I, I was in one situation where I was not happy at all. And I, I took my energy instead of pouring it into my work. I, I did what I needed to do for my job, but then I took my energy and ended up getting my master's in environmental science. That opened up a door in environmental work in remediation where I had a, an annual budget of over a million dollars to do cleanup work. Um, and I really enjoyed that job. Another situation led me to share a resume with someone I'd kept in contact with in the chemical engineering department. She shared it with an engineering consultant and I ended up, it, it enabled us to move back to Montana. And I worked for that consulting company for a couple of years before going back to Conoco. And then Daryl transferred up with Conoco. So he stayed with Conoco the whole time. Um, Another piece of advice is when you're working on a project, get input from a variety of sources. No one person knows everything. And in your job, you'll get to know kind of who's the expert in what areas. But even then, it's important to get input from people, especially if they're against your project. Well, I think it's worth your time to find out why they're against your project. What concerns do they have? Maybe you can address those concerns. And I remember I had one project on a, a unit called the FCC. And the plant people told me what the project problem was and in general, the direction the solution should go. And I, I contacted our headquarters expert, corporate expert on um, the FCC unit. And he had a completely different idea of what the problem was and led me in a completely different direction. So, you know, that happens. Um, so get advice from a lot of different people. Another example is prepping for this presentation. Um, I had a lot of ideas of what I wanted to share with you, but I also asked a lot of people, uh, professors and students inside your department, outside the college. I talked to a couple of recent graduates. I talked to our daughters. You know, what, what should I talk about? What should I not talk about? And so a lot of what I'm talking about is reflected in, in their comments as well. Don't be afraid to do the right thing, even when it's really hard. I was working at a gas plant and we had a situation where um, people who owned land where we had gas wells were given the rights to take off some, we call it raw gas. It's upstream of the gas plant, so it still has things in it like propane and butane. They had, as part of a contract, the ability to take gas off of that line and use it for their rice dryers or for other uses. But over the years, we found out that people were using that gas in potentially dangerous ways. And it got to be a really big, big safety concern. So I took up this project, I wanted to disconnect those users. And there were no lawsuits, we had it the right within our contract to do that, but we put together a compensation package for them and rolled it out. And I will never forget all the nasty, angry phone calls, letters, people showing up in my office, very upset because they were losing an affordable energy source. And I understood that, but what kept me going was I was doing it for their safety. Um, so. So when you know in your heart you're doing the right thing, then you, know, you, you can push through it. So that's when I felt like I was doing the right thing. And then there's another time when I did the wrong thing. I made a mistake. And I know as engineers, we work so hard to do things right. And uh, there was one example where I was working in Houston and my job was selling big lots, like 25,000 barrel lots of propane that we produce at our refinery to different customers and one evening I, I got a phone call that there had been a death in the family and I went to work the next day anyway thinking I was okay and I wasn't and I sold the same 25,000 barrel batch to two different companies and once I found out it's like okay 
I owned it. I went in and I told my boss, this is what happened. I'm so sorry, you know, and he said, Linda, go home. And so I, you know, the company had to go out and buy another 25,000 barrel of propane to then resell back to this company. And I thought I was going to get fired. I mean, that was a pretty big mess up. And instead they sent flowers. They were very good about it. And then they also gave me an opportunity to lead a project to develop software. So that didn't happen again. So if you make a mistake and you will, cause you're human, you know, admit it, fix it. And a lot of times you're going to need someone else's help to fix it, learn from it. And then the hardest part is like, move on, forgive yourself and move on. So, uh, that's regarding mistakes. Okay, so I've given some examples of some of this advice. Now I'm gonna do the lightning round. These are just really quick uh, pieces of advice. First, check your work. Um, quality is first. Schedule and budget are also important, but uh, quality has to be top. Find your strengths, find your niche in the company. What makes you special in that company and develop that. Have a good attitude. Uh, Attitude is so important to be pleasant, respectful, humble, patient, and a good listener. And never put something in writing that you don't want to read in the newspaper. When I was doing capital budget work, you'd be surprised what people would put in writing to try to justify funding their project. So be careful. Uh, keep showing up. Times will be tough. Don't quit. Just keep showing up. You have the power to push through. Um, just keep showing up. Begin investing for retirement immediately. It's a lot easier to save money when you're still kind of used to a student's budget. And the money you can save because of compounding interest will be hard to make up when you're in your 30s, especially if your company offers a 401k matching program. That's free money. Invest in yourself. And then my final career advice is um, to give back. Uh, MSU is a very special place and, and it, it needs you. If you have been fortunate enough to receive a scholarship, consider creating a scholarship, donating to a scholarship, um, be a mentor. You're gonna be getting some great advice and I'm sure some students who are coming in behind you can benefit from that advice. Okay, so that's it for career advice. I'm gonna give you some life advice. Uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, um, there are different definitions of success. It will vary from person to person, and it will vary from year to year. So what sounds like um, success now may be totally different five, 10 years from now because you will change. Uh, surround yourself with people who build you up, people who inspire you to be the best person you can be. And try to avoid people who attack your self-esteem or try to bring you down. Travel. You know, if you are lucky enough to be born in Montana, raised in Montana, attend Montana State, good for you. Now get out. There's a great big world out there for you to explore and it's different. There are a lot of different perspectives out there. The benefit that we've had of traveling and living overseas has is, is just been invaluable not only to us but to our children so i really encourage you to get get out there when you can safely and explore the world and learn. Uh, get out in nature nature is a very calming and steady influence in my life so i and we've got it so you know we're surrounded by it here so um if you need to just yeah take a walk out in the hills i find it to be very calming okay and then my last piece of advice I've been giving out this advice for 15, 20 years. And the last time I gave it out was a couple of years ago at the Women in Engineering uh, panel discussion, Women in Engineering dinner. And I had one of the professors come up to me and she goes, oh my gosh, I remember when you gave this advice 15 years ago, it's life changing, it's the best advice. So here it is, hire a maid. You know, when you can have someone come in every two weeks or so, clean the floors, clean your bathroom because you have so much to offer this world. You don't need to be spending your weekends, um, you know, scrubbing floors. If you choose to have a life partner, if you choose to have children, take that time and spend it with them and developing those relationships or investing in yourself or having an adventure or giving back to your community and leave all that um, other stuff 
to someone else. And I just cannot tell you how it, how wonderful it feels to come home after a long day at work and have a clean house. I, I just love it and can't recommend it highly enough. So that's my last bit of advice. And like I said, um, Daryl and I are retired. We live in Bozeman. If we don't get a chance to address your concerns or if you're more comfortable reaching out to us one-on-one, -on -one, uh, please get my contact information from Dr. Anderson or Dr. Minicucci. And I'd be happy to um, yeah, meet with you and talk about any concerns or questions you have. And again, that's based on my life, my journey, your journey is different, but I think it always helps to get a variety of input. So with that, I think I will bounce it back for questions. Thank you very much. Um, students, you can send a message to myself and panelists, and we also have questions in the Q&A. Um, when you said, so uh, Linda, I'm going to read the first question. When you said that your idea of success will change, what did you want us as students to take away from that? And that's from Robert. Okay, thanks, Robert. That's a great question. Uh, I think when some of us graduated in the 80s, we wanted to be upper level management, CEOs, live in a big house, drive a big car. And then when you see what sacrifices have to be made to do that, you know, maybe that's not worth it. Um, maybe once you have children, you don't want to be moving around every two years. Maybe you decide that instead of climbing a corporate ladder, you want to live in the Rockies and hike every weekend. And that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. So a question from Gretchen, why did you get the master's in environmental science? How did you decide that particular area of study was, was right for you? Mm. Uh, yeah, thanks Gretchen. Um, I think being born and raised in Montana, the um, care for the environment is one of my core values. And I was living in Lake Charles, Louisiana, home of McNeese State University. And they had a good environmental science program that was geared toward night school. So I could pursue that degree outside of work. And I also knew that Conoco uh, had a need for environmental engineers. So I, I just, it felt like a good fit. And it was something that I could accomplish while living in Lake Charles. While, while we're waiting for more stu uh, students to ask questions, I have a question for you. It seems that you well, uh, dealt with something that is not uncommon for professionals, which is the two body problem. You have uh, a couple working in the same field. How did you manage that both throughout your careers? And can you talk about some of the challenges that brought and some of the, um, the advantages, if there were any, um, in that? You know, when I first started working in the 80s, there were not many women engineers. So I think that companies were really making a concerted effort to attract and retain women engineers. Um, I will also say that Daryl and I worked very, very hard. Our first few years, we invested a lot in our careers by working six days a week, 10, 11 hours a day. Um, so I would like to say without sounding too presumptuous that we were solid employees. And so when um, one of us had an opportunity to transfer, the company that we worked for was very good about making sure the other one had a good job to go into. Um, so you're talking about advantages. In our case, in our company, at that point in time, I think it worked to our advantage because I maybe got, you know, if Daryl's job took him somewhere, they found an opportunity for me that may not have been available. I don't know. It's hard to say, but we worked very, very hard. And um, so I think we were a safe investment for them. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, every company has a different culture. I can't guarantee that. It's hard. 
All right, so we have another student question. Um, and they asked, as someone who worked in the industry for a long time, what would be your suggestion to soon to graduate students for their first job interview? Suggestion for your first job interview, I would suggest that you research the company online, understand their core values, understand their strategic direction, and how you hope to contribute to achieving their goals. I would also suggest that you don't try to limit yourself. Don't go in there saying, I only want to work in the Rocky Mountains. Um, you know, I think the first few years you should be pretty flexible, go anywhere, do anything. If that's something that um, you'd be interested in doing. And practice, I would say practice if you want to. I mean, one thing that that I've done with someone I mentor is I would be happy to set up a, a, a mock interview. I'll meet you at the student union building or we do it online, of course. Um, and we'll just, I'll pretend to be a recruiter. I did recruiting at MSU for several years and I'd be happy to do a mock interview and then give you feedback. Excellent, thank you. Um, we have another question and it says, did you ever have an experience where leadership in your company had a major impact on you, either positively or negatively? Oh, leadership. Why, that's a hard question. Um, yeah, I, I think that leadership can have a positive impact on you if, if the their goals align with your goals um, around, you know, safety, the environment, inclusivity, um, wanting to provide people with safe work environments, um, renewable energy. Uh, so those would be positive things, you know, when we had leadership that were really walking the talk and, and promoting projects in those areas. I think that would have a, a major, impact, you know, that had a, that would have a positive impact on me. It's like, yes, I can follow that person. Um, I don't know that we've really had leadership or at least not a situation where, that I can address where it was a negative influence. I know it well when, so I, I went to work for Conoco and then Conoco and Phillips merged and the Phillips culture was, much different. It wasn't as collaborative. It was more top-down management. So I think that was that was different. That took some getting used to. That was a, that was a tough question. <laughs> so we have a question from Talis um, who asks, how did you use your environmental master's degree in your work? Oh, hi Talis. Yes, I uh, at first worked in uh, Lake Charles Refinery as an air quality specialist uh, where I kept track of, you know, were we meeting our requirements, our emission requirements um, within the refinery. I'd be doing, you know, reports. If the EPA came to do an audit, I would meet with them. And if there was a, a project, a lot of times um, Congress or the EPA would pass regulations requiring that we install BACT, best available control technology, on a certain unit or if we're expanding a unit that we, you know, we need to, to apply a new level of quality um, on our emissions. So I would be involved in that to make sure that we do that in a timely manner. So that was my first environmental based job. My second environmental based job is when I moved back to Houston and I worked in a group called remediation technology. And that um, would be assigned to a certain area like I had California and we would be responsible for cleaning up sites that had been impacted over the years through like leaking tanks or like in California, uh, it, was, it was kind of unusual. We sold uh, a lot of gas stations to Douglas Oil. And Douglas Oil ran the gas stations and then they sold them off to different people. And then years later found out those gas stations leaked. Well, all those other businesses have then gone out of business and there was nobody there to pay the, or to, 
pay for the cleanup. So they came back to Conoco and said, well, you're the, you know, the last company standing, you get to clean it up. Even though we really feel like we're, we're, we're not responsible because the, um, the impact contained MTBE, which wasn't even used until after we sold the, re the gas stations. But I mean, that's the law. So we jumped in and managed those cleanups to, to clean up the soil and groundwater. So that was, that was interesting. That kind of took me all over the country in different cleanup sites, uh, working with consultants who did the day-to-day -day activities of monitoring the, the water and the soil and running the remediation equipment. All right, so now I have another question from Trevor. He asks, what are your opinions on the current state of the oil and gas industry? With the increase in layoffs and the accelerating transition towards renewables and electric vehicles, do you believe it is safe to join one of these companies for the future? Well, Trevor, that, that's a good question and I don't have the answer for it, but since you did ask me my opinion, I will give it to you. Um, I do think that the trend is toward electric vehicles, but it's not something you can just do within, you know, five to 10 years. It's going to take, I think, at least another generation. So um, possibly for your graduating class, that might be a, there might be a career in oil and gas. Beyond that, I, I really don't know. I mean, if you think about all the vehicles that you all drive, I would guess that the majority of them are still burning gasoline. I know our two vehicles, we do have a hybrid Prius, but um, you know, they all run on gasoline. So we're still gonna need gasoline for a long time. Um, we're still gonna need diesel and um, fuel oil, more so in the, in the East Coast. Uh, so it'll be around for a while, um, but is there gonna be a lot of growth in that industry? I don't think so. I don't think we're going to be building any new refineries in the near future, but, uh, Oil companies might be, like BP just announced a, a shift to renewables. So if you go to work for a company like BP, you might start out in an oil refinery and end up in renewables. I, I don't know, that's a tough one. Now for something completely different. <laughs> we, have, we have a question um, that just asks that you mentioned social awkwardness during your youth. How did and or do you manage that? Um, I think what, one experience that I had that I, I think was pivotal, pivotal was when I was in chemical engineering, we were hiring a new dean of engineering. The college was hiring a new dean. And I was asked to be the student representative on the search committee. And so I had to reach out to different student groups to get their opinions on different candidates. And that kind of forced me to stand up in front of people and talk. Um, which brings a good point, Toastmasters. I think I would recommend people join Toastmasters if they have any concerns about public speaking. Um, I, I've not had the opportunity to join Toastmasters. But um, my, the way I deal with it is I, I try to put myself out there, try to do it to speak, and I practice. I didn't just like walk over to this laptop and start talking. I, I wrote up my notes. I walked, talked through them a couple times. Like I said, I talked to different people. So practice, I guess. Find opportunities to talk. Doesn't make it easy, but. Maybe it makes it easier. All right. We have a question from Austin and he asked, during your career, was there a role or position that you accepted, which is something you did not initially see yourself wanting to do? If so, what were some surprising takeaways that you had from this role? Um. Yeah, at the Billings refinery, I was asked to coordinate the capital budget. 
I was in an engineering group and I was used to just working on projects, but I found out that I really like capital budget coordination and uh, I was a master at the Excel spreadsheet at the end of it. And it gave me a connection to the Houston people and in, in being able to look at where we spend our money as a whole in the company. And then when Daryl had an opportunity to go to London, my skills around the capital budget transferred into a job there where I coordinated capital budget for the European refineries, which was an awesome job. So yeah, that was, that turned out all right. Um, so how do you balance, this is a question from Jake, how do you balance setting up a successful career for yourself while also enjoying your life and seeking out new experiences while you were young? I kind of think we failed in that regard. We worked a lot early on. Uh, we, we did not lead balanced lives. I would say to do it better than we did it, I would, um, you know, if, if, you, if you have a life partner, communication is key. It, sometimes it's hard to do, but it's very important. Um, one thing that helped me was a book by Stephen Covey, C-O-V-E-Y, called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And I think um, when I read that and, and Conoco had workshops on it to help their employees lead more balanced lives. And I think that's when we really started looking at, you know, are we really happy or do we want to take a risk and do something different? And that's kind of how we ended up back in Montana in the 90s. Um, so I thought that was a helpful tool. But yeah, I'm not an expert on that. Um, at one point, I did uh, work part time. So uh, I know there were days when, you know, like if Daryl's working overseas and we have two small children and a house and a dog and, and it got to be too much. Well, I hired a maid that helped. And then for a while, I worked part time. And I think that helped. And it kept me um, connected. I was still working. I was still engaged. I was still contributing. And it helped our family be a bit more balanced. So those are all options and, and as time goes on, there are um, better choices for working families. I think even daycare was tough in the probably early 80s. I remember talking to people who were just a little bit older than me and daycare was, uh, was tough. It was hard to find care, childcare. All right, I have a question from Quinn. And they ask, what is your advice for taking a position that is not necessarily in the field you wanted? For example, starting in oil and gas, but pharmaceuticals is where you wanted to go. Is it better to wait for another job or take the position and just get that experience? Well, Quinn, it might depend on uh, how many irons you have in the fire. Do you think you might get an interview with a pharmaceutical? Um, how badly do you need to get a job? Like when I graduated, I needed a job. I had no money. So uh, I didn't expect to live in Louisiana. I didn't expect to work in an oil refinery, but it worked out well for me. But if your heart is in a different industry, is there something else you could do? Like a master's degree? Even if you do decide to go to work in an oil and gas uh, field, are there things you can be learning in that job that might transfer? I think in any job you're in, you can learn. Um, and then stay connected with the pharmaceutical industry and look for options. But if, you know, if companies investing in you to bring you into oil and gas, you know, you might, might feel some sort of loyalty to them for a year or two to, for them to get their investment out of you. Mm, that's a tough one, you know, uh, the bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Good luck with that, Quinn. <laughs> All right, um, we have actually two questions that are very similar. So I'm gonna read both of them and then maybe summarize them for you. Um, 
So Riha asks, how much should we expect to use the technical engineering knowledge we learned in school for industry? Or is the main part of the engineering degree about learning to solve, uh, learning to problem solve? Uh, so that's, that's Riha's question. And then Cade asked something very similar. Uh, did you use much of what you learned in school in your career? Did you mostly learn on the job or, or did you mostly learn on the job? Uh, in, in addition to that, were skills like problem solving and communication more sought after than other more chemi or traditional calculation, I presume, that's my interpretation, based skills. So essentially, you know, did you use what you learned at MSU on the job, um, summarizing these questions? Um, you know, how much of that did you do from MSU? How much did you learn on the job? And then what skills that you took from MSU were, were the most transferable? I think that's a fair summary of those two questions, I hope. Okay, all right, I'll try to answer them. And if, if I forget a part of that, please come back to me. Uh, because I chose to work in an oil refinery, I did use my chemical engineering skills. Um, unit operations was probably the most applicable. Unit ops lab. I didn't really use reactions. I definitely did not use organic chemistry. I should have. I don't know. I just. I still have issues with that class. <laughs> um, it, it, but that's because I chose to work in an oil oil refinery. I was also recruited by Procter and Gamble, and they wanted me to be a supervisor on a line that made shampoo or something, where that would be more problem solving and communications. So it, it depends on what field you go into. Definitely problem solving and communications are going to be important in either of those jobs. Probably whatever job you choose, those are going to be very, very important skills. And that's the thing about the problem solving. I mean, look at the different directions my career took. I mean, aside from being a process engineer in the refinery, I didn't really use um, a lot of the technical uh, things that I learned in class, but I did learn problem solving and data analysis and, you know, working on a team. On the job, there's a lot of on the job. As I mentioned, um, on your first job, it, it's very humbling. I mean, even if you graduate with a 4.0 and you get put in a situation like that, it's kind of painful, I'll be honest, how little you know. But you, but you have the skills and the foundation to start learning, and then you do build on it. You do realize that, that what you've learned at MSU does play into you know, your design of a distillation column or, or trying to troubleshoot a, a, a unit. Hydraulics, you know, hydraulics. Stoic, uh, we don't call it stoichiometry anymore. You call it, I don't know, when you... Mass and energy balances. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's, that's an important one. Yeah, that was good. Did I hit all the points? Okay. All right. I'm glad to hear that uh, organic chemistry will not be coming back in my life. <laughs> well, depending on where you go to work. Yeah, that's true. But I'll not be working any job where I have to do that. <laughs> Anyway, I have a question from Robert, and he asks, looking back at your college career at MSU, is there anything you took for granted? Hey, Robert. Um, living in Bozeman. I took that for granted. This is a great place. Uh, what else? I think the culture. You know, the Montana State has a unique culture. It's collaborative. It's supportive. Um, you know, the open door policies. When you get out into uh, a work environment, depending on the corporate culture, it may not be as supportive. You know, it may be really competitive where people um, knowing, you know, if they help you, that makes them less competitive or something. You know, it, that could happen. So, um, yeah, I wish I would have had more time for hiking when I was in Bozeman, but I was the kind of had to study hard. I studied really hard. 
I have another question for you. Well, we, in case other students want to want to chime in, um, the job market might be difficult um, this coming spring, uh, given given the the pandemic and hiring freezes may be taking place. Um, can you discuss some alternatives for for students or some strategies for? you know, moving forward um, while, you know, or not letting their degree getting get stagnant, I guess, is, is maybe an alternative. You know, throw out some ideas from your own personal experience and then some, some wisdom you may have to share um, from just seeing other things done as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess one thing, you know, when I graduated in a recession and there were not a lot of jobs, some of my classmates got their master's degree. Um, I don't know, you know, are there volunteer opportunities where you can work in natural resources or, you know, engineers without borders, do they have any sort of support roles where you could help with hydraulics? Um, reach out to people who do have jobs and find out, you know, do they know of anything, you know, like, like if, um, if you know somebody who's working at a refinery, you know, they may not have any jobs at the refinery, but they work with uh, chemical treatment companies like a, a Nalco. Do you know if they're looking for people, you've really got to work on the network. Keep, you know, keep yourself fresh by reviewing your textbooks, except organic. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, and then, yeah, network. Find out what other people are doing. How are they staying fresh? Not only at Montana State, but do you know some of your old high school buddies who went to other universities? What are they doing? Can you help um, anybody at the university, like career services? Be in touch with career services. I, and it's called the Yarnell Center for Student Success. Again, I'm reverting back to what it was called in my day, but um, just keep learning, keep asking questions. And then I have a, a friend of mine told me, no zero days. Don't ha never have a day where you did absolutely nothing to try to stay fresh, even if it's just a single email, even if it's a phone call, even if it's visiting website, thumbing through a book, a textbook, no zero days. I always build toward those uh, those goals. Um, and and I'm just going to throw this out here as as a reminder to students. They are part of AICHE, oh. and as as students as part of AICHE, you have access to all of those courses available to download for free um, mm -hmm. as students, including their entire process safety course sequence and other aspects of these things that. After you graduate, you if you have downloaded them, you still have access to them, just as a as a as a, a heads up. So um, I think some of those uh, things you could get certificates for completing them and things like that. They can be tools that that keep you fresh as you're moving on as well. I hope you don't mind me jumping in there as well. But no, I... not at all. In fact, you bring up a good question. I do have a friend who graduated a couple of years ago, and he got a uh, like a. a hazmat certification and process safety certification so those are things he did on his own while he was looking for a job so yes that's that's an excellent idea thank you um if students have any other questions certainly send them our way um in the meantime uh, I guess a, a little more fun question um, for me we see Ulysses, Ulysses prominently uh, behind you um, uh, so I was in a, a museum where they said that, that nobody actually ever finishes that book. Is, is that, is that factual? Um, there's my bookmark. <laughs> 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 and that's like, like, that's way at the beginning of the book. So that is funny. Yeah. And I, I pause, I, students don't know this, but when I first logged in, I was in front of a white, a white wall. But then it, the, the window got too big, so I had to switch. And then I got in front of my bookcase and then I thought, oh, are people gonna be looking at the bookcase thinking, oh, what does she read? 
So I do. Have, I have. I actually have read every one of those books, except this one. <laughs> That's a tough one. It's a tough one. Uh, the museum actually had it open so that you could say you, and it was on the last page of the book. It was a museum in Dublin, so that you could read the last page, so you could say that you finished Ulysses. Um, so, um, <laughs> I. I I'd really love to thank you. We, 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 oh, it looks like we had another question come in actually right here okay, at yeah. the last moment. Uh, yeah, a great question actually. Drew asks, did you ever consider starting your own company? Oh, I'm not that brave. No, I could not do that. I do have friends who started their own company and uh, good for them. You know, it's just like I have no desire to ride a motorcycle. It's just not me. I was a corporate girl. I like the idea of a big corporation where I know my role and I know I'm getting a paycheck. I, th I think it takes, I have such admiration for people who start their own company, but uh, from what I've seen, yeah, it's, it's a big, um, a big jump. You know, it's a big commitment, big rewards potentially, um, but I, alas, am not that brave. Some people are. And that's how you, you know, follow your passion. Again, what does success look like to you? If it's owning your own company, that's great. And there are resources at Montana State, I think, that can help you with that. You know, the, the Jake Jabs um, Center for Entrepreneurship, the MMEC helps startup companies with manufacturing. Uh, so there are definitely a lot of tools. And especially, yeah, if you start a company in Montana and employ Montana State graduates so they don't have to do like we did and leave the state. I, I tell you what, when I graduated, I could not wait to leave Montana. I was ready and I was gone no more than, I don't know, a few years and I could not wait to get back. And it took us about mm, 14 years to get back and we were here for 10 years. And then the only reason that we left was because they offered us this, uh, this unique, wonderful opportunity in London and, and so we did leave that, yeah. But we really, so much value our, our time and our experience out of state. And I would strongly encourage people to try something outside your comfort zone. Well, with that, I'd like to thank you so very much. I cannot, with all of the service you've, you've provided to the department for, for as many years as you've done it, I cannot think of anybody better to, to have kicked off uh, this webinar series than you. Um, we really do appreciate your presence um, and your participation in the department with our students. And, and this is just one of many contributions you've made over the years. So thank you so, so much. This was incredibly valuable. Thank you. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you without wearing a face mask. I actually put on lipstick, <laughs> but thank you. It's just, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, Montana State, again, it's a unique place. Thank you to AICHE and the students and Madison and Dr. Menacucci and Dr. Anderson for pulling all this together and holding my hand through this new technology. I would appreciate it and good luck to everybody out there. And again, like I said, if, um, if there's anything we can do, if you just need someone to talk to, we're here and we've seen a lot. And we're, if you wanna bounce ideas off of us, we're, we're here. So thank you. Good luck, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Good night. Thank you.